to our first session and it is called Reading Overview. Let's get started. If you take a look at this phrase, reading is, how would you complete it? Would you complete it with positive or with negative words? What words, phrases, or sentences come to your mind? Here I have a list of some definitions in terms of reading. So let's take a look at some of them. The first one, it says, the skill or activity of getting information from books. This one was taken from Cambridge Dictionary. As you can see, this is the literal definition of reading, just a transaction. Let's take a look at the second one, a process whereby one looks at and understand what has been written. This one is provided by William. In this definition, we have a keyword, understanding. In the last two definitions, we have clear points of view. In the first one, it is seen as a highly personal activity that is mainly done silently, alone. But in the last one is a two-way interaction in which information is exchanged between the reader and the author. So the first one is seen as an individual activity and the second one is more a group activity in which we're going to have some kind of communication either between readers or between the reader and the author of the text. As you can see here, we move from the traditional view, the literal one in terms of dictionary meaning, and then we move to a more holistic approach. Which of these is the correct definition of reading? Well, there, we cannot say that there is one single definition of reading. Reading depends on a lot of factors. For example, your background knowledge, your own experience on the topic, the time that you have available and the purpose. In other words, why are you reading? So take a look at the words uh, from my first question of reading is, and then do you have more positive or more negative words? If you have more positive words, well, that's great, but you need to also keep working on reading. If most of your words are negative, then this could be like a wake-up call to analyze what is happening here. Sometimes, uh, maybe these bad perception that you could have over reading is um, the consequence of maybe not having good instructors that could guide you in the process or not being lucky enough to encounter a good book or text that really calls your attention. So what we have to do is analyze our relationship with reading and why we have this type of relationship. I have some recommendations for you. The first one would be if you're only reading because you have to, because it will be just part of what you have to do on your job, then try to look for spaces where you can read for pleasure. That will definitely change your relationship with reading. Another recommendation is to analyze the where and the when you are reading. If you only read before you go to bed, then your brain will immediately create a connection between reading and falling asleep. And that's something that we want to avoid. So maybe you would like to read in the morning or maybe during lunchtime. And then the where, try to analyze the place where you can read more comfortable and where you can focus a little bit more, maybe surrounded by nature or alone at home. In order to think about these recommendations, let's analyze the characteristics of reading itself. The first one is that reading is an unnatural process. Some people say that reading comes naturally and that it's just easy, but that's not exactly the case. We have to be taught and we have to be trained in how to read. Read in terms of how to move from symbols into meaning and how to use the best reading strategies. And it should be a habit and it has to be constantly practiced. Another characteristic is that it is an essential life skill. According to Index Mundi, 97.7% of people here in Costa Rica are able to read and to write, which is one of the highest rates that we can find in around the world. And this is something that we should feel proud of. Uh, we need reading to receive information, to process it, to make judgments, and finally to make decisions on different topics. So reading is not a skill that you either choose to have or not, but you must. And the last one is that is part of effective literacy. As you can see over there, we have reading with capital letter and without capital letter. If we have reading with capital letter, it's because it involves all the cognitive process in terms of moving information to our brain for later production. And the key question here would be, what would you do with what you were reading? In terms of reading with capital letter, it involves the use of the mind, imagination, transforming messages, using background knowledge, and in other words, how you digest the content. Nowadays, with the easy access to information that we have thanks to technology, we have to ask ourselves, is everything that we are reading true? 
How can I know if it's true or not? So in this way, we're going to be informed readers. And then we have reading without capital letter, which is just the transaction itself, the process itself, in which you have the ability of moving from symbols into message inside your brain. We also have some models in terms of reading. The first one will be the traditional view of reading. According to Noonan, 1991, uh, basically, reading is the ability to move from symbol, in symbols interpret them, and then move them to the auditory system and being able to comprehend the message and be able to interact with others with that message. He calls this the bottom-up approach. Uh, basically, the technique begins with the eyes, taking a look at a piece of paper or any other type of visual material. This could be text, graphs, or even pictures. And then we identify letters and sounds, and we create this graphene phoneme correspondence. Later, all this information is moved to the short-term memory, or called the STM, for later use and production. Then we have the schemata. In terms of a schemata, we have Corel 1884. Uh, 1984 with three different types of schemata. The first one will be the linguistic one, then we have the formal one. I'm going to start with these two first. In terms of the linguistic schemata, uh, what we're going to do is that we refer to all the previous knowledge that we have in terms of vocabulary and in terms of grammar. Uh, basically, if you don't have enough grammar and enough vocabulary, you will not be able to understand the information that we have in the text. And then the output that you're looking for will not be the best one. In the other one, what we have is the formal schemata. Basically, with this one, we have what they call an abstract, encoded, or even internalized message. For this one, we're going to use our background knowledge to create new realities and to analyze the text that we have in front of us. So that's why every single time that we read a text, we can give a different meaning to it. Uh, in this one, basically, if we're talking, for example, about genres, and I tell you that we're going to move to storytelling, then words such as characters and settings and events will come to mind because this is what you have experienced previously with other types of stories. And finally, the other one is called the content schemata. For this one, uh, basically, language is a combination of different factors. Even though vocabulary and grammar is important to understand the message, we also have culture as part of it. So, for example, if we have a transaction in a restaurant, um, information about services and menus and ordering food and paying the bill will come to your mind. And in this case, everything is also related to your own culture and to a specific topic. The concept of schemata was first uh, used in terms of psychology, and it basically relates to this idea of going back and analyzing what you have to create different realities out of a text. And then we have the affective filter. So normally we focus on the first two, the traditional view and the schemata. Uh, because we say, yes, I can understand symbols on a piece of paper, I can transform that and create my own meaning, I understand the message, and that's it. But sometimes we forget about the last one, the affective filter, and in many cases, and personally, is one of the most important ones. In this case, what we do is that we work with the target language or the target text uh, in order to achieve and to look for readers that can easily work with challenges and have positive attitudes. Now, what happens if you have what they call high or strong affective filters, you virtually create a wall between yourself and the text. And with this, sadly, you will not get the same input. You will not know how to deal with challenges, and there is where, where anxiety and frustration comes to place. It is very different if we have a low affective filter, because we have the tendency to obtain more information, have more positive attitudes, and really take advantage of the learning opportunity. So as you can see, we have different models, and even though we have the traditional ones, the emotional part also has a great deal um, of importance here in terms of models. These are some of the sources that we consulted in terms of the possible definition of reading that we already know that it doesn't exist, just one single definition, it depends on different factors, and then in terms of a schema theory in reading. And I will leave you with this quote, the more that you read, the more things you will know, the more that you learn, the more places you will go. So now that we have a general view of reading, let's continue with the reading process itself.